Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar on improving delicate fertility results from the FECUND project. Uh, my name is Filippo Biscarini. I'm the scientific coordinator of the FECUND project. And today we would like to share with you some of the most relevant results that have come out uh, of this project. The project is approaching the end, and this is a good um, occasion to share with you uh, results and ideas related to delicate fertility. Uh, well, uh, I want to remind you that you're all uh, listening to this uh, webinar in a, a listen-only mode uh, for the moment, but you're welcome to, uh, to interact uh, with us through uh, the chat uh, and questions uh, during the uh, webinar, but especially afterwards when we have the discussion at the end of the uh, presentations. Uh, we will be having uh, in total uh, five uh, presentations today from um, high-profile speakers. Uh, the first one is Patrick uh, Lonegan from Ireland. Actually, he recorded his uh, presentation, so he is not physically available, and this means that we, you will not be able to ask him uh, questions. After that, we will have Eckhard Wolf uh, from uh, the University of Munich in uh, Germany on the use of omics for uh, reproductive success. Uh, afterwards, Pas Pascal Mermillot from uh, in Ra, France, uh, will talk about the role uh, of the Ovidot. Uh, in the reproductive su success under challenging uh, conditions. Uh, then it will be uh, my turn to uh, talk about uh, next generation sequencing technologies and biostatistics and bioinformatics uh, in, uh, uh, to, for the identification of potentially harmful haplotypes in uh, cattle, in the cattle genome. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, Pascal Salvetti from uh, Alice uh, French. Uh, France, we will uh, present uh, some reflections and perspectives from the industry. Uh, well, with this, I leave uh, the, uh, the word to the first um, uh, presentation, and uh, I will be looking forward to uh, hearing your questions at the end during the discussions. Enjoy the, the webinar. for not being with you live this morning as I'm currently attending a conference in the US. I'm going to give you a bit of background to the FECON project and describe the two models of cow fertility that were used in the project, a genetic and a metabolic model. Many reproductive technologies have been developed and applied to dairy cattle. The earliest of these, artificial insemination, has been around since the 1950s and has played a central role in genetic improvement by allowing high genetic merit bulls to sire hundreds of thousands of offspring in their lifetime. On the female side, multiple ovulation embryo transfer, which was developed in the 70s and is still used today, allows high genetic merit females to contribute more offspring to a breeding program than would be possible using natural mating. In the 1980s and 90s, in vitro fertilization technology was perfected, whereby we can now recover oocytes from living animals, generate embryos in vitro in the laboratory, and transfer those embryos back into surrogate animals to carry those offspring to term. Ultrasonography has been used to precisely map the pattern of follicle growth on the ovaries of cattle and in so doing, to develop strategies for the pharmaceutical control of follicle development and the precise timing of ovulation, which is important for um, pregnancy rate after artificial insemination, particularly with fixed time artificial insemination. On the male side, it's now possible to sort semen into X or Y bearing spermatozoa and in that way to predetermine the sex of the offspring at the time of insemination. And lastly, there are now technologies available, especially the latest one would be gene editing, which allow targeted alterations in the genome of animals to take place. This graph shows the antagonistic relationship between milk yield and fertility. On the pink line we see the increase in milk yield from 1980 to 2000 due to intensive selection for milk production. 
or the blue line illustrates the decrease in fertility that was associated with that increasing milk yield, measured here in terms of calving intervals. If we compare aspects of fertility in cows in the 1980s with cows in the mid-2000s, we can see that the main contributor to the difference in calving percentage between 55% and 40% is due to an increase in early embryonic death. In seasonal pasture-based systems of production, fertility is crucial and central to profitability. In such a system, the objective is to have cows reaching peak lactation at the same time as peak grass growth. And what that means in practice is that cows should calve sometime in late February and they should get pregnant again sometime towards the end of April in order to guarantee a calf per cow per year. In such a system, submission rate, which is the proportion of cows submitted for insemination, and conception rate, which is the proportion of cows that get pregnant to a single insemination, are the main drivers of profitability. In terms of targets, we would expect that 90% of cows have been submitted for insemination within three weeks of the beginning of the breeding season, and that the conception rate to the first insemination is in the order of 60%, such that at the end of a 12-week breeding season, the vast majority of the cows in the herd are pregnant. So the targets for optimum fertility would then be 60% pregnant to first service, more than 70% six-week in calf rate, and more than 90% 12-week in calf rate. Breeding indexes have evolved to reduce the weighting on milk production traits and increase the weighting on other traits affecting performance. In Ireland, prior to 2000, the relative breed index, or RBI, was based solely on milk production. The economic breeding index was introduced in 2000 and has evolved since that time to include other traits such as those related to fertility, calving, beef merit, maintenance, health and management. As you can see now, in 2015, the weighting on milk is about 30% and is equal to the weighting on fertility. We can therefore ask ourselves, where is the problem? Is it a follicle oocyte problem, an embryo problem, or a problem with the reproductive tract? that contributes most to decreased fertility. And in reality, as you'll see, the problem is multifactorial. It's not often that we can use human data as a model for cow fertility, but this graph makes a nice point. These are live birth rate data from women undergoing assisted reproductive technology cycles. The orange line indicates the fertility when the woman's own oocyte is used, and as you can see, as the woman ages beyond 36 to 38 years of age, there is a precipitous decline in fertility. However, if embryos are generated from oocytes recovered from donor women of a younger age and transferred into older women, fertility remains the same, indicating that the oocyte is central to fertility and that the uterus is capable of establishing a pregnancy long after the ovary is capable of delivering a good quality oocyte. These data from cows under heat stress illustrate the same point. In this set of studies, fertility was higher following embryo transfer where you bypass the cow's own oocyte than it was following artificial insemination, again indicating a role for the oocyte in infertility. Metabolomic analysis of follicular fluid recovered from heifers and postpartum dairy cows indicates that both groups separate away from each other. And amongst the main differences in the follicular fluid are differences in fatty acids, which we know are detrimental to oocyte quality. So the environment in which the oocyte develops is very different in a heifer, which are typically fertile, compared to a postpartum dairy cow, which, is, or which are of variable fertility. In terms of an overview of development, 
Following ovulation, the oocyte enters the oviduct where fertilization takes place. The resulting embryo enters the uterus on around day four in cattle. It hatches from its shell, the zona pellucida, on around day eight, and subsequently undergoes a process of elongation that is characteristic of ruminant embryos. The elongating conceptus produces copious amounts of interferon tau, which is the maternal recognition of pregnancy signals in ruminants and which prevents luteolysis from happening and maintains the pregnancy. Interestingly, fertilization rates in cows are quite high. From this cohort of studies, you can see that fertilization rate was in the order of 85%. However, seven days later, in the same cohort of animals, almost 50% of the embryos had died, such that only 53% remained viable, indicating that a high incidence of early embryonic mortality is a contributing factor to infertility. We have compared the ability of the oviduct and uterus of heifers and postpartum cows to support embryo development by transferring in vitro produced embryos endoscopically into the oviduct on day two and recovering the embryos on day seven. And in that study, what we saw was that 34% of the embryos were viable at recovery in heifers, while only 18% were viable in cows, indicating differences in the ability of the reproductive tract to support development. We repeated the experiment subsequently, comparing development in non-lactating and lactating postpartum dairy cows, and saw very similar results. In this case, 50% of the embryos were viable in the non-lactating cows, compared with only 31% in the lactating group, indicating that the environment induced by lactation results in suboptimal embryo development. Conceptus elongation is an, an entirely maternally driven process in that it doesn't occur outside the animal in vitro. However, as you can see from this group of day 15 conceptuses, it's a highly variable process with some small conceptuses and some very large conceptuses. And we know that there is a direct correlation between the size of the conceptus and the amount of interferon tau produced and therefore the likelihood of pregnancy establishment. The embryo itself can have a significant impact on whether or not it survives in the uterus. These nice data from INRA in France illustrate that the type of embryo transferred in this study generated from IVF, conventional nuclear transfer or somatic cell nuclear transfer can affect both the overall incidence and the timing of embryonic loss. Subsequently, the same authors, as well as a German group, illustrated that the type of embryo present elicits a different response from the endometrium, and that response can determine whether or not pregnancy is established and maintained. With this background, the FECON consortium came together. Two models of fertility were used, an energy balance model and a model of genetic merit. In work package one, a variety of samples were collected which were analyzed in subsequent work packages. Work package two, for example, involved analysis of follicles and oocytes. Work package three involved analysis of oviduct and embryo tissue, while work package four investigated uterine and conceptus interactions. In terms of the metabolic model, 40 in-calf primiparous Holstein Friesian heifers and 20 non-pregnant Holstein Friesian heifers with a similar economic breeding index were enrolled in the study. At calving, cows were randomly assigned to one of two groups and were either milked twice a day in the lactating group or were dried off immediately and left in a non-lactating group. Beginning two weeks prior to the expected calving date, all animals were weighed, body condition scored, and blood sampled twice weekly up until around day 90 post-calving. Similar measurements were recorded for the non-pregnant heifers over the same period. 
in terms of the samples collected, the Easter cycles of animals in the three groups were synchronized and preoperatory follicular fluid was collected for proteomic and metabolomic analysis at approximately day 40 post calving. In another cohort of animals, oviduct cells and oviduct fluid were recovered at day three after estrus for analysis. In order to study the effects of the oviduct environment on embryonic genome activation, or EGA, embryos were transferred in at the two cell stage and recovered from the oviducts at the eight cell stage, following in vivo culture. And at approximately day 80 postpartum, endometrial tissue, uterine lumen fluid, and conceptuses were recovered for analysis also. At the same time, oocytes and cumulus cells were recovered from the ovaries of slaughtered animals. The following series of graphs illustrates the body weight, body condition score, and metabolic changes that occurred in the animals in the three groups. This graph illustrates the changes in body weight, and as you can see, following calving, there's a dramatic decrease in body weight, as you would expect, and for the duration of the sampling period, body weight was not different between postpartum dry and lactating cows, but both were different from heifers. Similarly, body condition score was much lower in the postpartum cows than it was in the group of heifers. In terms of the metabolic hormones, insulin levels were much lower in lactating cows than in non-lactating cows or in heifers. Similarly, IGF-1 concentrations recovered rapidly in non-lactating postpartum cows, reaching levels close to that seen in heifers, while lactating cows experienced low IGF-1 levels throughout the study period. Following a spike in glucose levels at calving, glucose levels in the lactating cows were significantly lower than both the non-lactating and the heifer groups for most of the duration of the study. As a proxy for energy balance, concentrations of non-esterified fatty acids were much higher in lactating cows than they were in the heifer group or in the non-lactating group. And similarly, concentrations of beta-hydroxybutyrate were much higher in the lactating cows than the non-lactating cows. Taken together, these graphs illustrate that lactation induces a very different metabolic profile in the animals, which can have consequences for reproduction and fertility. In terms of the genetic merit model, three groups of heifers with contrasting genetic backgrounds were assembled for the collection of the same cohort of reproductive tissue samples. There were two groups of Holstein heifers, one with a low estimated breeding value for fertility and one with a high estimated breeding value for fertility, as well as a group of Montbelliard heifers with a high estimated breeding value for fertility. This table summarizes some of the characteristics of the three groups of animals. And if we just focus on the reproductive parameters, you can see that the estimated breeding value the reproductive traits were positive in the Holstein 30 plus group or high fertility group and in the Montbelliard group, while they were negative in the Holstein 30 minus group or low fertility group. As with the metabolic model, the same cohort of samples were collected for distribution to partners in the FECON project, ranging from follicular fluid, ovidoc cells, embryos pre and post embryonic genome activation, endometrial tissue and conceptus tissue and uterine fluid, as well as oocytes and cumulus cells. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll hand you back to my colleagues who will describe some of the results in more detail. Thank you.
Good morning, everybody. My name is Eckhard Wolf from the Fien Center of the University of Munich. And I have now the pleasure to introduce to you so-called omics technologies that can be used to understand basic mechanisms of reproductive biotechnology and also to understand failures in reproductive. So let me start with a very general statement. Fertility sets the limit for animal production and breeding. First of all, fertility itself is a factor of productivity, but fertility also affects the general genetic progress by affecting the generation interval and also the selection intensity that defines the proportion of animals that can be used for breeding. Uh, Unfortunately, fertility is decreasing with uh, increasing yield. So therefore, we need novel readouts for fertility research. Infertility or reduced fertility causes major economic problems to the cattle breeding industry. Unfortunately, fertility traits are negatively associated with production traits. The heritability of currently recorded fertility traits is low and therefore we need novel phenotypic measures of fertility. Our idea is to use molecular, so-called omics profiles of gametes, embryos and tissues of the reproductive tract, for instance, the endometrium, that may provide novel molecular phenotypes that can be used for differential diagnosis of fertility problems, for mapping of fertility-related expression QTL, and also for high marker association studies and genomic selection. Why is it necessary to look into these molecular traits? You can see here as a basis level the, the genome structure and chromatin organization. So the genome provides the genetic information. However, there are multiple layers between the genome and the final phenotype on a cellular or organismal level, which includes transcription of RNAs, then basically splicing of the RNA and RNA editing, then also a post-transcriptional regulation, the level of proteins and the level of metabolites. If we look at this process on a more simple level, we have here again the different layers of the genome, of the transcriptome, all the RNAs, of the proteins and metabolites, and then the final phenotype like milk yield or fertility. Of course, we have genes that affect multiple phenotypic traits. On the other hand, many traits are affected by different genes. However, these correlations are very difficult to understand if we do not look at the intermediate layers, the transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, and of course, these connections, these networks leading from the genome to the final phenotype are different for each individual trait. If we come back or reflect the first uh, presentation, there are of course many biological filters that limit reproductive success. And as outlined in Pat Lonergan's presentations, presentation, these first, uh, uh, these first uh, biological processes like oocyte maturation and ovulation, then fertilization, embryonic gene, genome activation, pregnancy recognition signaling, and implantation are very important because many failures of reproduction occur in this very first period. So this is again the setup of our experiments. And uh, as mentioned before, we had a metabolic model and we had a genetic merit model. And importantly, in work packages two, three, and four, we always looked at the oocyte embryo conceptus plus the respective maternal environment in order to look at the interactions between these compartments. Well, when we want to look at the level of the transcriptome, if we want to profile all the RNAs, there are different technologies. Everything started with array-based technologies that basically depend on hybridization 
of an RNA that is labeled in the sample to be analyzed and a probe that is on a chip. And uh, these techniques that are available, for instance, from Affymetics or from Agilent, they have some problems. For instance, it's relatively difficult to standardize the background. And another problem is you can only detect transcripts for which you have a probe on the chip. And therefore, recently, uh, transcriptome analysis moved more to the sequencing approach, mainly by the so-called next generation sequencing. And here you can see the principle of the Illumina technology. So first, an RNA is reverse transcribed into a cDNA. And then these cDNAs are uh, coupled to two uh, linkers on, on each end which hybridizes on a chip where you have many probes to one of the linkers and then basically each of the cDNA molecules is locally amplified on, the, on this chip, the so-called flow cell, into a clusters and this, these clusters are then sequenced by incorporating fluorescent nucleotides and by this incorporation of a fluorescent nucleotide Basically, each incorporated nucleotide can be identified, and this is done in a massive parallel way, so the output of these technologies is very high. What are the advantages of RNA sequencing? So, this approach is not limited uh, to detecting transcripts that uh, correspond to an existing uh, sequence on a chip Then we can also precisely localize the transcript boundaries we can also provide information how transcripts are spliced by looking at the positions where two exons are attached to each other. Importantly, we can also reveal sequence variations, for instance, single nucleotide polymorphisms. It's much easier than with the array-based technologies to standardize the background and to compare different experiments. There is a much larger dynamic range so there is basically no upper limit for quantification and the quantification is relatively accurate because this uh, technology generates a digital readout it really counts the transcripts. Let me introduce the advantages by showing one example how we used RNA sequencing to analyze embryonic genome activation. As you can see here Early development mainly depends on RNAs, maternal RNAs and proteins that are stored in the oocyte. Over time then these RNAs and proteins are degraded and the embryonic genome is switched on, a process that we call embryonic genome activation and importantly this is a species specific event that occurs very early at the two cell stage already in the mouse, at the four to eight cell stage in pigs and at the 8 to 16 cell stage in ruminants. Until recently, it has been very difficult to analyze this process because there is a period where we have clear and clearly an overlap between transcripts that still originate from the oocytes and transcripts that are already produced by the embryo itself. We did an RNA sequencing experiment where we were able to show the exact onset of genome activation for more than 6,000 genes. So basically we compared different stages, germinal vesicular oocytes, metaphase 2 oocytes, and then embryos at the 4 cell, 8 cell, 16 cell, and blastocyst stages. And in all of these stages you can detect a large number of transcripts from many different genes. If we compare now the genes that are differentially abundant between adjacent stages, you see that in the beginning between uh, metaphase 2 oocytes and germinal vesicle oocytes, the number is relatively small, or oocytes, a relatively small number, but then the numbers of genes or transcripts that are different between adjacent stages increases markedly, especially between the 8, the 16 cell stage and the 8 cell stage, indicating that actually major genome activation is taking place at this stage. But this is just a general view and we cannot say which are the individual genes that are switched on. 
And in our lab, basically, we were able to refine this approach by looking at transcripts that are not present in oocytes. So if they appear, they must be of embryonic origin. We looked for transcripts that, based on their sequence, can be identified to be derived from the paternal allele. And this is also an indication that, basically, this is an embryonic transcript. But most efficiently was the approach to look for incompletely spliced transcripts, so transcripts that still contain intern sequences. And by using this approach, we were able to map the exact onset of activation for almost 6,000 genes in total. So this is an approach demonstrating how powerful RNA sequencing is. And this was also the reason why we used this technology to analyze all the samples produced in the FECON project. Well, coming back to the approach again, we look now for the different interactions between oocyte and follicle, embryo and oviduct, and conceptus of uterus. And this is just one example where uh, we used uh, the, the genetic model. So this was Montbéliard, and then Holstein cattle with a high estimated breeding value for fertility or a low estimated breeding value for fertility. We investigated different tissues on oocytes and embryos, matured oocytes, oviductal tissue, cumulus cells, and endometrium. And when we look at the total numbers of differentially expressed genes between the different samples, we can clearly see that in oviductal tissue, there seems to be a major effect of genetics because there we find a large number of differentially abundant transcripts between Mobilia and Holstein cattle, either 30 plus or 30 minus. However, when we then compare the numbers of genes, differentially abundant genes between 30 plus and 30 minus, which is very important because Mobilia was just used as a kind of external control, we see that the gene expression in the endometrium seems to be particularly important. And this is consistent, uh, or here's, here you see uh, again that a large number of uh, genes are differentially abundant between 30 plus and 30 minus in uh, the endometrium. And uh, we were also able to identify all these genes, and these lists are now available to all participants of the FECOM projects and also to the participating industry. And later on, this will be made, made open. The fact that the endometrium is such an important environment for the conceptus and is very sensitive to changes in the conceptus was already lined up by the finding that basically the endometrium responds differently to fertilized as compared to cloned embryos, and this has been found by us and also by a French group. So how can we use this experimental data, especially the transcriptome data? We did an, a defined experiment and basically came up with a large number of differentially expressed transcripts. For some of those, we looked also uh, to the corresponding proteins and did localization studies. And how can we transfer now this information to the general cattle breeding populations? Well, basically, we can do it in different ways. On the one hand, we can look whether basically for transcripts that we found in our experimental model, we find genetic variation in our breeding populations that explains a part of uh, differences in, in fertility. And on the other hand, we can look at SNPs that have been detected to be important in the breeding populations, and we can uh, look back whether they are in genes that we identified in our experimental approach. And this works very well. Some years ago, we did an experiment where basically we looked for SNPs in genes that are upregulated in endometrium during de estrus. So basically, these are genes that prepare the endometrium for implantation. And we looked then into SNPs that were identified in the German Holstein population, whether they were uh, associated with fertility. And by this approach, 
we were able to identify a number of SNPs that had favorable effects both on fertility and on yield traits, although these traits are normally negatively associated. And this, of course, can now be done for each individual breeding population based on the differently expressed transcripts that we found during the FICON project. However, it's important not to stay with the level of the transcripts because we need to look also at the level of the proteins, which are the actual biological players, players because the transcript is not a surrogate for protein abundance. For instance, uh, mRNA capping and tailing are essential prerequisites for translation. The abundance of translatable mRNA is regulated by SI and microRNAs which we cannot see if we uh, do not look at the level of proteins, then the mRNAs must be successfully transported to the ribosomes and translated into a protein. If we just look at the level of the RNA, we cannot predict whether this actually occurs. And then also, of course, the formation of a functional translation initiation complex is required to uh, to allow translation, efficient translation, which cannot be predicted at the level of the RNA exclusively detectable at the protein level are translation events, all post-translation modifications like phosphorylations, glycosylations and so on, which may be responsible to activate or deactivate signaling cascades. We can also uh, uh, judge secretory effects, for instance, uh, from the uterine, gla uterine glands in the, into the uterine fluid or also the release of individual proteins from deposits only when we analyze the protein level. Well, similarly as for the transcriptome, the level of the RNAs, we have different pipelines to quantitatively analyze the protein layer. Uh, one is based on liquid chromatography and MASPIC analysis of the total proteome. And the goal here is the de novo detection of quantitative alterations between proteomes, for instance, in the metrium, endometrium of high versus low fertility cattle. And the general approach is basically a digestion of the protein uh, samples, then a prefractionation, and then the separation of proteins, and then the use of mass spectrometry to identify and quantify peptides that are specific for a particular protein. And then we have also another approach, the so-called targeted selection, re selection reaction monitoring, and this allows us to quantify very precisely a selected number or a selected set of proteins. So this is basically to establish a kind of diagnostic array of proteins that can also be used in practice. This is an example of differentially abundant proteins in oviduct fluid uh, that were revealed between low and high fertility Holstein or between lactating uh, versus, versus heifers. And you can see a number of differentially abundant proteins were identified. Interestingly, the number of differentially abundant proteins was much higher in the genetic model as compared to the metabolic model. And many of these proteins uh, have interesting functions where we can also explain that they are related to fertility. This is an example where the selected reaction monitoring approach was used to establish an array where basically in one shot 27 different proteins can be accurately quantified in all sites, and this can be very useful, for instance, to monitor different systems for IVF or to establish other bioassays for samples taken in the context of reproductive biology. So, let me summarize. The FICOM project revealed hundreds of differently expressed genes in all sites, embryos, conceptuses, and their respective maternal environments, depending on metabolic condition in the metabolic model or genetic merit for fertility. These transcriptome profiles are novel readouts providing insight into genetic networks underlying fertility problems. 
These networks may also be used for functional validation of positional candidate genes identified in breeding populations and corresponding proteome studies revealed interesting sets of differently abundant proteins which may serve as biomarkers or culture additives for bovine embryo production. So finally, I would like to thank all the co-workers directly involved in these studies, of course the colleagues who uh, designed the genetic and the metabolic model, Pat Lonergan and Pascal Salvetti, then my colleagues at the Gene Center, Helmut Blum, Stefan Krebs, uh, who did the transcriptome studies, Mies Forde and Stefan Bauersatz, who helped a lot with the interpretation of these data, and Georg Arnold and his team, who did uh, the proteome studies. And I would like to thank you all for your attention. Is it okay? Good morning to everybody. Uh, so my name is Pascal Mermiot. I'm working at the National Institute of Agronomical Research in Nuzigi, a small village located uh, near Tours in France, uh, about 200 kilometers in the southwest from Paris. And today I will talk to you about Ovidux as a key player in the success of reproduction, reproduction under challenging conditions. So when considering the fertility of uh, dairy cattle, as mentioned by Patron Langan before, when you look at the increase of milk production in cattle during the past years, you can see that the fertility of the animals are decreasing uh, in parallel to the increasing of uh, milk production. If we look at uh, the, the timing of this loss of pregnancy in the dairy cattle, you can see that the pregnant pregnancy loss is occurring during all the pregnancy, but the most uh, loss is during the early stages of pregnancy. So it means that this early period of uh, Reproduction and each loss of pregnancy has a, a cost which uh, impacts uh, the, the, milk, the, the milk production. So, when looking at the FECUN uh, project and the different work package in this project, I will focus my talk on the work package 3 dealing with audited uh, uh, analysis and also our package 7, which is uh, aimed at using the in vivo information to uh, improve the in vitro production of embryos in cattle. Looking at the, the oviduct, uh, it's clear that the oviduct has an important functions in uh, the early reproduction, and especially three main functions is the capture of the oocyte at ovulation, the survival, transport, and uh, selection uh, of sperms and interaction of gametes during fertilization, and also the regulation of early embryo development from the one cell stage to the late morula stage before the embryo is entering into the uterine cavity. So the hypothesis we had is that the reduct is, pro is providing a steady optimal environment for gamete survival, fertilization, and development, and also is uh, providing a protective environment for these gamete embryos, again challenging conditions. First, we will have a look at the in vivo studies. I will not come back in details to the two models that were studied in a fecund project, a metabolic model, uh, with uh, heifers, uh, uh, 
lactating cows and uh, dried cows just after calving. And the genetic model with the Montbelliard efforts, efforts uh, Holstein, Holstein efforts, and uh, Holstein efforts with low fertility. For this, for all of these groups, we were collecting overlooked at the day 3.5 uh, of the Earth 2 cycle. These oviduct was were collected at slaughterhouse after slaughter of the animals. They were dissected and separated between the ampulla region of the oviduct, which is uh, the region which is the closest from the ovary, and the isthmus region, which is connecting the oviduct to the uterine wall. For the, each of these segments in the ipsilateral side and contralateral side from the ovulation, uh, we were uh, flushing the segment to collect the ovulate fluid for the proteomic analysis of this fluid. And also, we, we, we were scrapping the ovulate for collecting the mucosa for the transcriptomic analysis of these cells. First, I will look to the transcriptomic data. And here you see a comparison between the ampulla uh, at the ipsilateral side of the oviduct from the, on the side of the ovulation versus ampulla of the, on the contralateral side in the, in the different groups, heifers, dry, and lactating of the, of the metabolic model. Here you have the same uh, comparison for the isthmus region of the oviduct compared between Ipsi versus contralateral for the three groups of the model. And as you can see here, uh, the isthmus is much more sensitive to the size, to the side of ovulation. Uh, in, in fact, you see that we have almost 2,000 uh, differentially expressed genes between the uh, Ipsi and contralateral isthmus, while we have only 60 differenti differentially expressed genes in the ampulla. And this is true for the three groups of animals, for the heifers, dry, and also uh, in the lactating, but in a lesser extent. So the isthmus transcriptome was more sensitive to the vicinity of the corpus luteum, and heifers and dry shared more, uh, heifers and dry groups shared more uh, differentially expressed genes uh, in these groups. If we look now uh, for uh, of the ipsilateral isthmus in the metabolic models, here you have a comparison between uh, groups between groups two by two, heifers versus dry, uh, heifers versus lactating, and dry versus lactating groups. You can see that there is a low number of differentially expressed genes between these groups, uh, and the lowest number between dry and lactic, is observed between the dry and lactating. So here we have uh, the number of differentially expressed genes in the effer effer versus dry uh, comparison, 223, effer versus lactating, 127, and dry versus lactating, only 15 differentially expressed genes. If we, look at, if we look at the proteomic level, as represented here and as already presented by Eckhart Wolf before, uh, uh, 1,700 and 1,900 proteins have been identified in the uh, metabolic and uh, genetic models, respectively. And in all conditions, a low number of uh, differentially expressed proteins were observed. And the lowest number was observed between dry and lactating cows, uh, represented here, only uh, 12 uh, differentially expressed proteins between these two groups, dry versus lactating. And uh, as uh, observed by uh, Eckhart Wolf before, a larger number of proteins were differentially expressed in the genetic model as compared to the metabolic model. So, some conclusions about these in vivo observations. A high number of oviduct expressed genes are tightly regulated by the presence of the corpus luteum, especially in the isthmus, uh, due to hormonal regulation, probably. The energy balance has a low incidence of oviduct gene expression and protein secretion. The genetic background has a stronger incidence on 
protein secretion and gene expression too. And that uh, data mining is still on the way, especially for the genetic model and to analyze more in detail the gene lists. Some data about in vitro studies. Uh, first, we uh, try to analyze the effect of the ovidectomy uh, on the survival of sperm in culture. And for, to do that, we were incubating sperm cells in vitro for a period of six hours. And, for, and at different moments of this culture, we were doing the evaluation of the viability and mobility parameters of, this, uh, of these sperms. We compared the survival of the sperms in different medium, medium alone, or supplemented with 10% of oviduct flush coming from here, represented the 30 plus and 30 minus model, and different segments of the oviducts. We observed in general that the presence of oviduct flip increases sperm survival and, and motility, as represented. Represented on this graph, you can see that the uh, linearity of the motility of the sperm is decreasing rapidly in culture for the control group, whereas it is concerned much higher at, uh, at a much higher percentage in the uh, sperm's culture with oviduct fluid. And this is true whatever the origin of the fluid in this model. We also used an in-vitro model to analyze the interactions between the growing embryo and the oviduct epithelial cells. And using this in vitro model of co-culture, we showed that the oviduct cells are increasing the development rate of the embryos, they are increasing the cell number in these embryos, they are changing their metabolism pattern and increasing their cryoresistance, increasing the cleavage kinetics and uh, also changing the parameters of the genome activation in the embryo. On the other hand, the bovine embryo was also inducing some changes in the oviduct epithelial cells in this co-culture model. <coughs> Sorry. For example, the presence of the embryos was uh, inducing a surexpression, overexpression of the STAT1 gene and the translocation of the product of these genes to the nucleus. This STAT1 activation induced the overexpression of different interferonto-dependent genes and uh, also the overexpression of some other genes, indicating that other pathways of the interferonto are also involved in this dialogue between embryo and oviduct. So it seems that a real dialogue is existing between the oviduct and the developing embryo, and that this dialogue results in increased development rate of, and quality of the embryo. We also, also showed that some exosomes are present in this oviduct fluid uh, that we can collect from the... Uh, and we were asking ourselves what are the mechanisms involved in this embryo oviduct dialogue. This, this dialogue can, can rely on, on traditional uh, cell to cell communication uh, mechanisms such as the ligand to receptor interactions which can uh, be uh, induced by hormones like steroid or proteic hormones and also by both factors for a local effect as represented here for hormones uh, in which the signal is, tr is transmitted through the blood uh, circulation to reach a, a far, a far target cells and local mediators which can uh, act on the closed cells. Cell can also communicate through gap junctions for uh, exchanging small molecules or by direct cell contacts. But it, it's known now that uh, also cells can communicate, communicate by, by exchanging extracellular vesicles, which represent a new paradigm in cell communication. These macrovesicles here is represented some exosomes, which are uh, uh, small 30 to 100 nanometers membrane covered vesicles, which are secreted by most of the cells uh, in vivo or in vitro. Uh, exosomes can be uh, found in the most body fluids like urine, saliva, epididymal fluid, and also uh, in follicular fluid and uterine, uterine fluid. Uh, exosomes can shed uh, mRNA, 
microRNA lipids, proteins for transferring genetic and proteomic information to target cells as a way uh, to cell to cell communication. And they can confirm new property in the recipient cells. Exosomes are produced inside the cells in such uh, large vesicles called multi multivesicular bodies, which are accumulating uh, cytoplasmic compounds and, and packing these compounds in exosomes and finally can fuse to the external membrane to uh, liberate the exosomes in the extracellular medium. So, we found some exosomes in the oviduct fluid and also in the supernatant of oviduct cell culture. And in these exosomes, we identified 319 proteins. And we, you can see that there, there are some differences in protein contents between in vivo and uh, in vitro collected exosomes. Amongst these proteins included in exosomes, we found uh, many proteins involved in metabolism, uh, immune rest response, and protection uh, against heat and oxidative stress. Uh, next, uh, generation sequencing, sequencing of um, microRNA and messenger RNA is now on the way for these exosomes. We also showed that the, these exosomes are able to enter into the embryos here you have a bovine embryo at the blastocyst stage. We used uh, fluorescently labeled exosomes, which were coagulated with this blastocyst. In blue, you can see the nuclei of the blastocyst, and in green, you can see that some exosomes were penetrating into the blastocyst and into the blastocyst cells. This is a blastocyst surrounded by a zona pellucida, and it shows that the exosomes are able to cross the zona pellucida to enter into the embryonic cells. Here is the same uh, procedure for hatched blastocyst without the zona pellucida, and you can see that you have also many more exosomes in this blastocyst compared to the uh, earlier stage, and that these exosomes seem to have a perinuclear location. This is more visible here with a larger uh, enlargement. You can see here the exosomes which are located around the nucleus in the blastocyst and arch blastocyst. Then we use these exosomes to, to try to uh, analyze the effect on growing embryos. And so uh, bovine in vitro produced embryos were captured in the presence of uh, control medium or medium uh, supplemented with uh, fresh exosomes or frozen thawed exosomes. There, were no, there was no effect of the presence of exosomes on the cleavage rate between these embryos. But if you look at the development of the blastocyst rates here, you can see that uh, the presence of uh, exosomes, and especially the frozen exosomes, in increased uh, the rate of development to the blastocyst stage as, as compared to the control group. And this increase was significant from the seven uh, days uh, of, de of development. The, the frozen cell exosomes are have a, a uh, stronger effect than the fresh exosomes uh, in red here, uh, for which the, the increase was significant only after nine, nine days of culture. And as you can see here, uh, the embryos were starting to degenerate between uh, day eight and day nine in control condition, and the, exos the present of exosomes were was uh, increasing the survival of these embryos during this, this period. And so if we look at the hatching of the blastocysts at day nine, you can see here that in fact, uh, the presence of uh, frozen exosomes here is increasing the hatching rate, the survival of uh, provide embryos, uh, of bovine embryos at day nine. Also, the presence of frozen exosomes were, was increasing the number of cells in the blastocyst. So, to conclude about this in vitro, this in vitro observation, oviduct fluid is uh, prolonging the sperm viability and mobility in the culture. A real dialogue exists between oviduct and embryo, improving development rate and quality in co culture. And also exosomes from oviduct fluid can mimic the effect of co-culture 
on embryo development. So for as a general conclusion of these in vivo and in vitro observations, ovidic gene expression activity is highly regulated by hormones but poorly sensitive to metabolic status of the, of the female, providing a steady and protective environment to gametes and embryos. Oviduct environment is improving sperm survival and embryo development. Oviductosomes, it means oviduct collected from the, uh, exosomes co collected from the oviduct free, may be at least partly responsible for embryo development in poor improvement. Just some perspectives uh, of this uh, work. Uh, the perspective is to using like uh, therapeutic exosomes, it means that we can collect exosomes from the ovidute fluid or for, from uh, the supernatant of uh, cultured ovidute cells. These exosomes can be engineered, that can be, for example, uh, fused with liposomes containing some interesting compounds, proteins or RNAs, and these uh, natural or engineered exosomes can be used for improvement of sperm quality, preparing sperms for IVF, ICSI, or cryopreservation. They can be used for improving oocyte quality during in vitro maturation uh, using uh, follicular fluid exosomes. And they can be used also for oviduct exosomes to improve embryo development up to the blastocyst stage. And just to finish an example of the possible use of therapeutic exosomes, it's a, a work that has been shown recently in the International Extracellular Vesicles Conference uh, using a, a, a knockout mice model, a, a mouse uh, knockout for the PMCA4, uh, which is a, a transmembrane uh, calcium channel. Uh, the males of uh, the knockout males uh, for the PMCA4 can produce the sperm normally, but these sperms are not motile, they are not activated. And uh, so the these males are uh, not fertile. If you take exosomes for, from a uh, wild genotype female and you uh, purify these exosomes and co culture the sperms from the knockout male with these exosomes, you rescue the sperm motility and these motile sperms are bearing PMCF4 on their membrane. So it, shown, it shows that it, it is, a, a, of course, a, a pathological problem, but you can see that exosomes are uh, able to rescue some uh, problems in the spirit. So I thank uh, all the FECUN project participants for this uh, common work, and I would like to thank you also for your attention. Sorry, I see, I just see that I have questions. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, Pascal, yeah. do, you want to, do you want to answer the question? Uh, I can answer no if you want. All right, please go. So I have a first question for Joanna Vicky, which is asking uh, where do the exosomes intervened? originate from. Uh, we think that the uh, exosomes are, originate, are originating from the oviduct epithelial cells and especially the secretory cells in this epithelium. And uh, in fact, we can uh, culture these cells and observe that these cells are also producing exosomes in vitro, confirming that uh, these uh, exosomes ob observed in the fluid are coming from the oviduct epithelial cells. Uh, 
So another question from uh, 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 Gibson, Gibson Pessoa, uh, Brazil, uh, talking about uh, thermal stress. Uh, we didn't uh, study uh, thermic uh, stress in the fecund project, but as I mentioned, and as also Eckhart mentioned, uh, a lot of genes expressed in the ovidut are uh, dealing with uh, stress, and especially we observe the presence of uh, each of proteins uh, in the ovidut fluid and also in ovidut exosomes. Uh, so maybe uh, the ovidut is able to to protect embryos again uh, against uh, heat stress, and especially uh, by uh, HSP, we can be involved by in the uh, protein uh, uh, folding and uh, protein elimination after heat stress. I don't know if I answer uh, your questions properly. <laughs> All right, thank you, Pascal. Uh, I guess we can now proceed with the next uh, presentation. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Filippo Viscarini. I'm the uh, coordinator of the FACUNT project, and I'm a bioinformatician and biostatistician at PTP Science Park in Italy. Uh, this talk will be on the use of uh, next-generation sequencing in cattle reproduction for the identification of potentially harmful haplotypes. Uh, next-generation sequencing is not only about uh, genomics, Besides whole genome sequences, uh, there is also genotyping, genotyping by sequencing, RNA sequencing experiments, small RNAs, uh, DNA methylation, for instance, uh, proteomics, metabolomics, metagenomics, and metabarcoding. So, a, a large array of uh, uh, potential uh, next generation sequencing techniques and experiments. And most of these were applied in the uh, FECUND uh, project from several uh, reproductive tissues, as we already saw, uh, for instance, the follicular fluid, cumulus cells, oocytes oviduct, the uterus, and from different types of animals, uh, namely the metabolic and the genetic models that uh, were conducted uh, in the project. Uh, in this talk, I will concentrate on the genomics part, uh, especially, especially the high-density uh, viral genotyping and the exome sequencing, uh, with the uh, objective of identifying uh, deleterious variants in the genome of uh, cattle. Uh, genetic, genetic recessive disorders are common uh, in cattle, for instance, one can think of complex vertebral malformation on chromosome 3 and cholesterol deficiency on chromosome 11 in host and freezing cows, or CWC15, which is another mutation on chromosome 15 in jerseys. Uh, such mutations are often associated with uh, reduced fertility through, through, for instance, embryo loss or perinatal mortality. Lethal or deleterious recessive mutations may be discovered in the genome from haplotypes that are common in the population but are never found in the homozygous state in live animals or are found at very low uh, frequency. This idea was, was, bring forward from, uh, was brought forward from uh, Van Raad and, and colleagues in 2011 and, and has proven to be very effective in identifying uh, haplotypes linked uh, with uh, fertility. Uh, this is a list of such haplotypes in breeds, in dairy breeds like Ayrshire, Brown Swiss, Holston, and, and Jerseys. And this list is available uh, in the website of the U United States Department of uh, Agriculture. In the federal project, uh, we set out to identify potential uh, novel deleterious variants in, uh, cat in the cattle genome. Uh, and uh, in host and cattle specifically, we had 1,000 animals which were genotyped at high density for about 777,000 uh, SNPs. And the steps were first identifying uh, homozygous haplotype deficiency regions, regions of the genomes uh, which were 
not, never found or found at very low frequency in the homozygous state. Independently, independently, the exome was also analyzed to look for variants, polymorphisms inside the exome, which had a potentially deleterious uh, effect uh, on fertility. And this was uh, estimated uh, through the variant effect predict predictor uh, from uh, biological databases. Uh, then these two sets of information were combined to find uh, deleterious variants which are inside uh, HHDs, homozygous haplotype deficiency regions, and these were further analyzed to study, to assess their negative impact on fertility. Uh, additionally, also their association with production traits was evaluated. Uh, these are some of the results. Uh, we found 261 uh, homozygous haplotype deficiency regions in the genome host in Friesen uh, cattle. Uh, and uh, we also found from the exome uh, over 18,000 missense uh, variants. Of this, uh, through the uh, variant effect prediction, uh, over 8,000 were putative deleterious variants. And 73 such variants were found to be inside uh, homozygous haplotype deficiency regions in 52 different um, HHDs, because well, some of these uh, were found to harbor more than one deleterious uh, mutation. Uh, 11 of such uh, deleterious variants uh, were found to be on chromosome 29, and uh, 56 out of 73 uh, deleterious variants were found to be in QTR regions for uh, cow fertility. Nine of such variants in four haplotypes uh, had a strong association with uh, fertility. And, uh, well, for instance, one variant on chromosome uh, 10 uh, was found to be a novel missense uh, uh, mutation of variant in the gene UBR1. This is a gene which is involved in uh, impaired pancreas development, mental retard retardation, growth problems, and acute care for cal calving is actually close uh, to this gene. Uh, these four haplotypes, which, has, uh, which have a very strong association with fertility, also appear to be associ associated with uh, production traits, namely fat and protein yield, which confirms uh, a negative link between uh, fertility and production in uh, cattle. Uh, once uh, such uh, haplotypes or mutations have been identified, have been discovered, uh, it is of interest to uh, predict which animals actually carry uh, these, um, uh, these recessive variants. Uh, in fact, uh, heterozygous carriers are phenotypically non-apparent, but they may spread the mutation in the population. Uh, there are laboratory tests, of course, to uh, identify carriers, but this can be expensive or time-consuming, uh, whereas SNP genotypes are often already available uh, in cattle, uh, for instance, uh, because of uh, genomic selection uh, programs. So it is very convenient to use um, SNP, uh, SNP genotypes, which are already, already available, to predict, to identify the carriers of uh, such. Uh, within the project, we uh, first tried this approach with the BH2 haplotype on chromosome 19, which is a haplotype which is associated with stillbirth and reduced cow fertility in brown Swiss uh, cattle. We had uh, three, over 3,000 brown Swiss bulls and cows, uh, which 500, over 500 were carriers, and the rest were no carriers, of course, and we used uh, the uh, 1,512 SNPs on chromosome 19 from the 50K SNP chip. And we also used a reduced set of SNP from the 7K, the low-density SNP chip. Uh, linear discriminant analysis was the method used to identify uh, carriers, and we uh, assessed decreasing subset of SNPs, and a 10-fold cross-validation was used to estimate the uh, error of prediction. These are the results. You can see for the uh, 50K SNP chip on the right and for the 7K SNP chip on the left. Uh, and you can see, well, uh, the error rate, error rate was, uh, the total error rate was quite low uh, in both cases, around 0.5% with the 50K4 uh, uh, SNP chip, and uh, around 1% with the uh, low density uh, 7K SNP chip. Uh, after this, we uh, did moved a step forward, and we uh, tried to predict directly carriers of the mutation behind the BH2 haplotype on uh, chromosome 19, uh, because in the meanwhile, this mutation has been discovered, and it's the uh, QBD1 mutation. Uh, this is a missense mutation which causes a, a microtubular defect in the airway cilia, in the uh, respiratory uh, ways of animals, 
we, uh, this causes uh, chronic respiratory disease, which in turn uh, causes stillbirth and perinat perinatal mortality in calves. Uh, the prediction of uh, mutation carriers directly rather than haplotype carriers can, be uh, can have advantages. Uh, well, in many cases, the haplotype and mutation concordance is very high, can be uh, as high as 99%, but it is not um, uh, always uh, the case. Uh, for instance, in complex vector vector formation, there are different haplotypes associated with the mutation, and so it is uh, much more precise to predict directly the mutation carrier rather than the haplotype carrier. In this case, we had um, about 400 brown Swiss uh, boots and cows, 250 carriers, and again we used um, the SNPs on the uh, chromosome uh, 19. We compared five uh, classification methods for the prediction, uh, K-nearest neighbor, last supernalized logistic regression, support vector machine with either a linear or a radial kernel, and multi allelic gene prediction, which is a haplotype-based method. And again, cross-validation was uh, used to estimate the error rate. Here you see the results, the total error rate uh, on top, then the false negative rate and the false positive rate uh, in the uh, bottom part of the, of the figure. Uh, and uh, so you can uh, see that uh, most methods, um, except K-nearest neighbor and maybe also the support vector machine with the radial um, kernel, uh, were very accurate in predicting uh, carriers of the uh, mutation. Well, the, closest, the closer to the uh, center of the target, of course, the better the prediction, and you can see that the error rate overall is very, is very low, it's about 1% uh, or less. Uh, so the prediction of the identification of, of the prediction of mutation carriers using uh, SNP genotypes is potentially very ac accurate. Uh, overall, the error rate is close to or lower than 1%. Uh, in classification problems, it is very important not only to look at the overall error rate, but also at the error rate in the different classes, in the carriers and non-carriers, so the false negative rate and the false positive rate, because data can be unbalanced and it is relevant to look uh, at how uh, accurately you can identify the carriers and the non-carriers of the uh, mutation or the haplotype. Uh, SNP genotypes uh, are usually already available, so this is a convenient and cheap approach to identify uh, carriers of mutation. And it proved also to be uh, quite fast, at least in the uh, study that we uh, performed. Well, another application of genomics and haplotypes are runs of homozygosity, which are stretches of homozygous uh, SNP genotypes in the genome. And this uh, may be used, uh, on one hand, to estimate inbreeding in the population, uh, since they tend to reflect more closely uh, identity uh, by descent compared to identity by state uh, estimated through the uh, homozygous at individual uh, SNP loci. Additionally, runs of homozygosity may uh, harbor uh, mutations, uh, recessive mutations. Therefore, they can also be used to uh, uh, identify to detect uh, regions of the genome which are associated to some, uh, to some phenotype. Uh, and this leads to uh, runs of homozygosity based approaches for association studies. Uh, RAW may be used to localize uh, mutations in the genome, uh, mainly recessive mutations, uh, not lethal. And uh, the, this idea is based on the fact that homozygosity patterns are different in cases compared to controls. Uh, we expect to see uh, higher homozygosity uh, in cases. And uh, homozygosity patterns are expected to be different around the mutation compared to the rest of the genome. Again, we expect a higher degree of homozygosity around uh, the site of the mutation. This is an example from a work um, uh, by Jeff Pollot, uh, 2012 and he used this approach to uh, detect a region on uh, chromosome 4, on the, uh, the bovine chromosome 4, uh, which apparently, uh, which is potentially associated to perinatal mortality in calves. The similar approach was used by our group to uh, study uh, reproductive diseases in hostings, and we found some regions on chromosome 15 which uh, are differentially homozygous in cases versus controls, so in animals with reproductive disease compared to uh, healthy uh, animals. And uh, just reversing the concept, we can also look at run of heterozygosity in, in the genome, so stretches of the genome which are uh, heterozygous in the uh, in individual animals and in the population. This is a similar concept to uh, runs of homozygosity, but the uh, biological interpretation can be, uh, of course, different. Uh, runs of heterozygosity may be uh, used to, stu to study the genome for balancing selection, 
for negative selection, for introgression, or to study hypervariable regions, or for many or for other reasons that uh, have not occurred to us yet. This is an example from, uh, uh, from the Chillingham uh, cattle breed. Uh, the Chillingham cattle is characterized by a high degree of homozygosity. Therefore, in, in the genome, you see where in the top of the uh, figure, these blocks of heterozygous, so you have uh, of heterozygosity, you have the, uh, basically uh, predominantly homozygous genotypes with isolated blocks of heterozygosity. And this gave us the idea of runs of heterozygosity. And this is a striking difference with the uh, genome of other cattle breeds, whereas where the heterozygosity is more evenly uh, distributed. Uh, then we uh, also looked at the association between these uh, blocks or runs of heterozygosity in the chilling genome and the deleterious, deleterious haplotypes that have been uh, uh, discovered, identified by Farad and colleagues. And we saw that in most cases, the uh, runs of heterozygosity detected in the genome of uh, the Chillingham cattle corresponded, matched the uh, deleterious uh, uh, mutations or haplotypes found in the uh, cattle genome. This uh, points to the fact that uh, those regions can actually not be homozygous because they are lethal or deleterious in the homozygous state. Uh, therefore, reinforcing the hypothesis that uh, some uh, regions of the genome, genome need to be in a, a heterozygous state. Uh, contemporarily, we uh, also developed an, an R package uh, to detect uh, runs of homozygosity, runs of heterozygosity in, ge in the genome uh, using uh, two uh, different methods. One is a method based on sliding windows, and the other is a windowless uh, uh, method. And uh, what well, this package scans the genome to, uh, for runs, either of homozygosity or uh, heterozygosity, depending on what the, the researcher wants to uh, look for in the genome. And uh, well, in the output are uh, files with uh, runs per animal and per chromosome, and uh, a number of plots to uh, visualize uh, these runs in the uh, genome. This is just to give you an example. This is, these are two breeds, the uh, uh, brown Swiss and Piedmontese. This is chromosome 2. And you can see at the beginning of chromosome, chromosome 2 in the Piedmontese on top in blue, uh, well, a signal uh, which corresponds to the myostatin uh, mutation where in the Piedmontese cattle you see an excess of runs of homozygosity. Uh, the same chromosome, the same uh, results actually, but here we look only at um, uh, runs for the uh, Piedmontese uh, breed. And again, you see this uh, clear signal uh, of uh, runs of homozygosity at the beginning of chromosome 2, which corresponds to the myostatin uh, mutation. And again, a different way of looking at this. This, this is um, uh, the number of times that a SNP is in a run of homozygosity. And here you see the comparison between the brown Swiss and the Piedmontese, again, the same chromosome. Also. And again, you can visualize uh, this peak corresponding to the uh, myostatin uh, mutation. Uh, once uh, the deleterious mutations, regions associated with uh, some phenotype, or uh, results from uh, epigenetics, small RNA uh, sequencing, proteomics, once you have these signals, once we have found the genes that are associated to a phenotype, uh, a common uh, next step is to look for the role of such uh, genes in the, uh, in the biology of the animal, which is called the functional analysis of, uh, uh, of genes. And typically, when well, you want to look for uh, gene ontologies, the geotherms, which are the biological processing, processes in which a gene is involved, or the uh, molecular function that they um, carry out in the, uh, in the organism, or the cell compartment tissues where such genes are expressed. You may also want to look at gene cells enrichment to actually have a better uh, characterization of the uh, phenotypes in which uh, those genes are involved, or the met metabolic pathways that are related to, uh, to those genes. In the uh, FECNUM project, we also developed a pipeline to standardize and automate um, this uh, process. Here you see just um, a, a simple example with uh, three uh, genes that were uh, detected in one of such experiments. I guess it, this was an RNA sequencing experiment. And uh, typically you can have uh, well, lists of uh, geotherms associated to those um, genes and the metabolic pathways in which those genes are uh, involved. We now come to uh, some conclusions. 
Well, uh, we saw uh, throughout the course of the project that uh, bioinformatics and biostatistics are very useful uh, tools uh, for research and applications in animal fertility and reproduction and breeding. Uh, one of such applications is to detect uh, genomic regions that are associated with uh, fertility. Uh, we saw the uh, uh, haplotypes, the the deleterious or lethal haplotypes which are associated to fertility, but also while well, you can perform other kinds of studies like the, uh, the studies based on ransom homozygosity that we just uh, saw. Uh, bioinformatics and biostatistics can also be used to identify carriers of such deleterious or even beneficial if found uh, mutations or violence in the genome. Uh, tools have been developed also to uh, carry out the functional analysis of uh, signals of association or expressions uh, to better understand the biology underlying animal reproductions, uh, reproduction and uh, well, um, uh, also well, um, uh, tools uh, for applications have been uh, developed uh, during the project tools that can be applied to breeding, uh, farming and uh, research. And uh, well, with, this, I, with this I thank you for um, your attention and I will be happy of um, uh, answering to any questions you may uh, have. Let's see if there are already some questions. Uh, well, let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, not sure, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I don't see them, so I think I can uh, give the word to the next uh, speaker. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Pascal Salvetti, and I am working for Alice, France, as a manager of uh, the experimental station we have in the center of, Fran in, of France, in Nuzi, just near uh, Pascal Mermio location. And um, I was involved in the project in many tasks, but I was also the work package nine leader, work package uh, called uh, validation of the outputs of the project. So this work package is uh, still under the under progress, and uh, my my talk is most more focus, focusing on um, a bringing company feedback on the output of the project. We had some presentation from academic labs, uh, academic units, and just a view from the industry about the project. First of all, just to, to summarize uh, who are we, uh, what's Alice company, because we are not a, a breeding company, we are a, a private company with a very particular status of union of cooperatives for animal reproduction and genetics in cattle, sheep and goat species in France and Belgium. So, uh, we are very atypical uh, private company. We are considered uh, like uh, SMEs from the European Commission, small and medium enterprise, but we are a non-profitable non company. Uh, our objective is not to make money. We have no nothing to, to, to sell, but we have members that give us money each year and we, we uh, give uh, in return some services. So, we have two kinds of members. Uh, the first uh, kind of members is breeding companies, as you can see in the in the map on the on the left. Uh, these breeding companies are responsible of the genetic genetic progress and the production of semen of high genetic uh, bull. And the second kind of uh, members we have is artificial insemination centers cooperatives. And so on the on the, mat, on the right uh, side. Um, and we, we are responsible to the dissemination of the genetic progress by inseminating into, into the farm uh, with artificial insemination technicians. So, 
we are not a breeding company, but we are like a, an umbrella organization uh, above the breeding companies. So our members give us money each year to have services, and the first uh, service we we uh, we have is to defend and represent the interests of our members in front of authorities at the national, European, and international level. And for example, uh, we can speak about uh, Eurogenomics Consortium uh, because uh, Alice and uh, its members are involved in the Eurogenomics Consortium. Uh, it's a large consortium built uh, a few years ago uh, to um, to collaborate between uh, European breeding societies and to be uh, to to have a, a, a best uh, genomic prediction and to be stronger in in front of uh, competition outside from Europe. Uh, the second point is. We help and advise our members, and so we have legal support. We have also a, a training school for artificial insemination technicians, and we are also involved in a genomic evaluation um, in collaboration with INARE, INARE and Institut d'Elevage in France, so official genomic evaluation of uh, the bulls. And the third point, and it's the point why we are involved in the FECUN projects, so we have a great uh, R&D staff, research and development staff, about 25 people uh, with uh, a lot of skills to make innovation in genetics and reproduction uh, for, our, for the services of our members. Just to show you um, our location in France, so our main quarter are in Paris, in Bercy, and for research and development activities we are to three other locations in Lille, in, in the north of, uh, of France, with some people uh, working on pheromones and mass spectrometry. We have also one big location in Jouy en Josas, uh, directly in uh, Inare, Inra labs, uh, with uh, 16 people, uh, with particular skills in semen and cell technologies, genetics and genomics evaluation, and epigenetics. And finally, uh, we have a third location in Nuzi. As I told you, I'm the manager of uh, these facilities. Uh, we have an experimental station for bovine uh, with particular skills in uh, biotechnologies of reproduction and uh, embryo biotechnologies like IVF uh, production, uh, genotyping, and everything. Uh, and also one people working in uh, NMR spectrometry. Uh, where uh, Alice were involved in the FECUN project, so we have the, the map of uh, already presented uh, by other partners of the project, and we are mainly involved in the uh, genetic model management in our facilities in Nuzi. So it, it was a big job at the beginning of the project, producing more than 6,000 samples, biological samples. So uh, a very uh, big, big job. Um, we. We are also involved in the reproductive biotechnologies and biomarkers development. And finally, uh, as I told you, I'm the leader of the last work package, work package nine, about the validation of But we have two, two activities in that work package, people working on uh, genetics to validate some recessive lethal mutation, and we work also to validate some biomarkers uh, candidates uh, from the previous work package. And what is important to to have in, in mind is uh, at least have a great access to uh, to the field uh, with a, a great network of uh, cooperatives, technicians, and farms, where it's sometimes possible to make samples to produce samples in a, in a short time. The first question we can we can uh, speak about is why did involve get why did Alice get involved in that uh, kind of project? Uh, first point is to take advantage of the multiplicity of skills, and um, as you can say, see uh, in the previous presentation, uh, there is some very strong people working on omics analysis, some strong people working in genetics. And I think it's quite impossible to have uh, all these kind of people in uh, in one staff. So 
it's very uh, really an advantage to collaborate and to share the, the skills and uh, the knowledge. The second point is to answer to Alice member needs uh, in three three topics. First is embryo technology optimization, because in a context of a genomic uh, selection, uh, some uh, some embryo production was made on the female side with donor station, and it's very important now to disseminate uh, and to optimize the genetic progress to increase and to optimize the embryo technologies. The second point is to improve prediction equa equations for genomic selection and for fertility traits. As uh, Eckhart said, uh, it's a very complex uh, trait and irritability is still low, but uh, with that kind of project, by opening the black box of early embryonic development, we perhaps will be able, able to, to find some uh, genetics markers for oocyte quality, for oviductal quality, for uterine environment uh, quality, and to improve the, the geno genomic prediction. And the third point is biomarkers for new services to farmers. It's very important now to give an advice to, to farmers uh, uh, because now the, to manage a farm and to manage a herd it's very complicated with a lot of technologies uh, with uh, cause more difficult to manage so it's very important to uh, improve and to increase the services to farmers and to find new biomarkers could be uh, nice uh, to the herd management. The third point, and we cannot uh, hide this, is do more with the same amount of investment because uh, I said to you that uh, uh, the members give us money, but uh, to do research we have to, to find extra extra money to, to, uh, to, to make experiment and um, it's a very good opportunity to, to collaborate between academic labs and private companies to, 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 to do more. And finally, uh, it's the last point to be a player in the landscape of European Research Network because uh, these facilities in UZI are quite new, opening in 2014, and it was a good opportunity to, uh, to, 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 to be in the network and to share uh, these facilities with others. The major issues from the FECUN project, uh, first of all, is a uh, very a huge amount of work done to produce the samples and to analyze the samples with a lot of data, uh, omics data particularly, and this knowledge is very important to open and to understand the black box of early embryonic development, which is very important for uh, fertility optimization. The second point uh, I can highlight is to identify some recessive lethal mutation, which is very important now in the genomic context. Very important to increase the fertility by playing and by uh, to, 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 uh, to deal with um, mating plants into the farm to avoid to take a, a bad bull, a bull with risk of recessive lethal mutation. So it's a, it's a very important point. The third point is the identification of negative energy balance and fertility biomarkers. Uh, we have no presentation today about uh, that, but um, we, are, um, we are evaluating or uh, validating the candidates biomarkers found in the previous work package, but it's still under the progress, so we have nothing to, to present today. And finally, uh, some work done particularly by Pat in Ireland or Giovanna in Italy to optimize in vitro embryo production by uh, some using data uh, collected from previous work package and also uh, the work done by Pascal Mario on exosomes. And it's a very good uh, uh, to, for the industry to, to, to see that because IVF embryo quality is still remaining a little bit low on comparison with in vivo embryos. Um, so we, it, it was a good point. So a, a lot of uh, a lot of 
issues, a lot of findings for the project, a lot of knowledge, but with so important issues. But I think it remains few innovation for the industry. And uh, as you know, industry wants always more, <laughs> always more in innovation, concrete application. And um, what I saw is we, we have a lot of omics data which are under integrated uh, for now, for the moment. And my question is, does we have the tools for a global understanding of how does it work? Uh, because it's quite complicated, as uh, Eckhart mentioned, it's quite complicated to, to make the link and to, to understand the functional pathways. Um, but the second question I, I wanted to raise is, does we have time and money to do that? And it's another big question because the Fecun project is uh, four years of, uh, of research, of work, and within the time, this period, we only have time to collect biological materials uh, and to analyze the biological materials to have the data, but we don't have the time to integrate all this data and to go towards innovation. And perhaps it's a, it's a weakness of this kind of project uh, to have money and time to, to, to make the first steps, but not to go uh, and to finalize all uh, the knowledge produced. We perhaps also have some differences in terms of results valorization, um, because industry wants toujours uh, always more of application concrete innovations. And wants also publication, but less than researcher. Uh, people from working in academic labs want to publish the results, and that is a good point, but we cannot uh, only publish the results. So we have to go and to find an application of this knowledge. So sometimes we have uh, some differences, differences in terms of valorization. And I, I write uh, the sentence from uh, Erwin Conan from CRV, Netherlands, uh, which said, fast uptake of innovation is essential to make European dairy industry the most sustainable and competitive one. So uh, we, we really need to, to go uh, further this, this, uh, this knowledge. To conclude, uh, the Fegun project was for me a very good experience because it was a first experience for me at the European level but balance for um, uh, the, the, the things I mentioned in my previous slide. So a large amount of knowledge, a very good collaboration, but some few innovation. Uh, it's a pity to have a, a large amount of knowledge and to stop the project in, at the end of the month. So we have a really co-challenge cool to face between industry and academic labs. It's big data integration. Uh, all this omics analysis uh, to, to go to biomarkers uh, development for management of the herd, to go to uh, the development of new phenotypes for new traits of selections. So not only for reproduction, now the industry is also focusing on food efficiency, disease resistance, uh, methane emissions. And please keep in mind that uh, a good phenotype to be used by the industry should be easy to collect, rapid to collect, and cheap. Uh, for that, I think we have a great job to integrate and to modeling uh, all the functional pathway uh, we, we highlight in the project. And to do that, I think we, we will have a very good opportunities uh, into the H 2020 framework, uh, 2014 for 2020. Uh, it's a new uh, funding from European Commission with three pillars. Uh, excellent science, of course, uh, it's, it's a base. Uh, industrial leadership, and that it's important to go more towards innovation and also, of course, societal challenges. So thanks a lot for your attention, and perhaps we will have some questions uh, during the next uh, discussion.
Uh, well, all right. Uh, I guess now we have some time for a general discussion and some questions. I invite all the speakers to uh, switch on their uh, webcams. Uh, maybe a starting point can be, I see that uh, there was a question in the, uh, in the panel for the general discussion from Brian Wickham. Uh, well, his question, I will read this out loud, uh, is, uh, well, he says that the genetic model appears to explain more of the variation in fertility than the metabolic model. And so, uh, Brian Wickham uh, asks, do we need to change our view, view of fertility? Is it time to consider fertility more a function of genetics than environment? Well, uh, to me, I'm a geneticist and, uh, well, my, my informatician, and the uh, role of genetics in fertility is, of course, clear. Uh, but also in view of the uh, achievements, the improvements that have been uh, obtained in the last uh, decade uh, since, the, uh, since fertility has been introduced, included in the uh, breeding objectives and, and selection indexes uh, in cattle populations. But I would like also, would like also to hear the uh, opinion of um, the other uh, speakers, uh, Eckhart, uh, Pascal Mermiglio and Pascal uh, Salvetti. So please, uh, if you can add some comments on, uh, on this. So maybe I can start. It's pretty clear that genetics plays a major role for fertility. If you look into the OMIM catalog, there are at least 2,000 syndromes that are associated with reduced fertility or eliminated fertility. The problem is that the genetic effects are often overlaid by environmental effects and therefore using classical fertility traits like non-return rate and things like this it's very difficult to estimate, it, uh, to estimate the, the breeding value for fertility. And this is the main reason why basically the FICON project tried to find new molecular traits that gives, gives a better insight into pathways that affect fertility. Well, thank you, Eckhart. Uh, maybe the two Pascals can add some, uh, something on this. <clears throat> yes, I fully agree with what uh, Eckhart said about uh, the interest of the, the models. And I think the most models we can have, the most uh, interesting point we can target after that. And we were talking just before, I had a question about the, the heat stress. And it was not a model in the frequent project, but it's also, I think, an interesting model to take in account to find new targets uh, which are uh, difficult for reproduction. So the most model we have, the most answers, and uh, the most uh, data we have about the control of fertility. Well, thanks, Pascal. Uh, Pascal Salviti, maybe you can add uh, the perspective from the industry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, also that uh, fertility, uh, the, the genetic is very important to, to expand the fertility, but we cannot, uh, un we cannot uh, hide the environmental effect. It's very important. We we deal with omics analysis, but uh, I think uh, the environment has a, a lot of impacts on, on epigenetic maps, on the expression of genomes, and it's very important not to, to focus only on genetics, but also to take care of the environment of, of the animals. All right, thank you, uh, Pascal. I see that is another question. This is actually directed uh, to me. Uh, and the question is about the criteria used to define uh, runs of homozygosity and uh, whether well, the uh, pruning of the data for a low minor running frequency is to be applied in this case or not. The question is from Henriette Berg Olsen. Well, uh, it is true that the, the parameters used to define uh, runs of homozygosity affect a lot uh, the results that you get. Uh, there are a number of studies that report different, different results with different parameters. We're also working on this. Uh, using different parameters and different methods. Uh, the one based on sliding windows and another one which is windowless and we just proposed. And we will uh, soon um, uh, uh, report results. Uh, well, the, uh, actually, the uh, definition of the parameters is quite critical to the results that you get. So well, uh, the interpretation of results is very important when you uh, want to look for runs of uh, homozygosity. I think there is not yet um, um, a definite answer on uh, which parameters to use and which are the best parameters to, to use under every circumstances. As for the um, 
data editing filtering for uh, low uh, minor radio frequency. Uh, this is something that is common in genome wide association studies, but definitely, well, I think that this should not be done when you want to uh, look for runs of homozygosity in, in the genome, because of course, if you remove the homozygous uh, uh, SNPs, then you are not bound to uh, detect anything um, in the uh, genome. Uh, well, I hope I have answered sufficiently to uh, Henriette. Uh, well, I, apparently there are no other questions uh, at present uh, in the uh, in the pain. Uh, well, I have uh, two questions that I would like to ask uh, to uh, my fellow speakers. One is to is directed to Pascal Salvetti mainly. Uh, what are, uh, in his opinion, the technologies that will be mainly adopted by the, industry, by the breeding industry in the near future. We saw uh, omics, uh, reproductive, reproductive technologies, automatic phenotyping. There are also technologies that uh, are used to uh, directly uh, modify the genome, like CRISPR. Uh, so what do you think, Pascal? What is the industry most, most ready to adopt? Um. It depends. Uh, omics, uh, omics technologies are very important because in the context of genomic selection, the phenotypes is the king to develop a new traits of selection. So uh, omics uh, analysis are very important to, to that, but um, we need to understand what we, uh, what we produce. As I mentioned in my presentation, we have a huge amount of data, uh, big data uh, that is difficult to to understand and to uh, to highlight the good and the right pathways, okay. Uh, so I, I would like to uh, to ask a question to Eckhart or how how he sees the future of uh, of this data uh, for the integration of all this knowledge. How how to go to towards innovation or how to go towards. Uh, uh, concrete application, how to be sure to, to choose the good and the right biomarkers. So Filippo just mentioned CRISPR-Cas, which I think is very important in this context because this allows us for the first time to functionally validate candidate pathways. Of course, we can identify pathways that are differentially regulated by, by differential gene or protein expression but we still do not know, are they really relevant? Using the CRISPR-Cas system on embryos or on cell cultures from the maternal tract, we are for the first time able to inactivate such a pathway and look for the biological consequences. And I think in the future this will help a lot for the interpretation of such complex data sets. Yeah, you're true. I, I think uh, the CRISPR technology is a very good uh, tool for research. Um, but, Filippo, you raised also the question for CRISPR technologies for the industry. But I think it, it's my point of view. It's not the, com the, the point of view of Alice. But I think it's too early to, to use uh, gen editing in a, in a commercial application. You know, we need no, to I, use... I, I did not mean a com commercial application. Yeah, yeah, I sure. just as a tool, as a research tool, for the validation of, of findings from omic studies. Yeah, sure. But it's to answer to the Filippo's uh, question about uh, does the industry is ready to use uh, gen editing? Uh, I think we can use it for research, but not for uh, commercial application, I think. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Pascal, for your, um, for your views. Well, I have one final question for um, uh, Ecker and Pascal Mermillo. Uh, uh, do you think that uh, out of a fecund or other projects in which uh, you were involved, uh, do you think that some really useful uh, biomarkers have been identified that can tell uh, us early uh, what is the fertility status of uh, cows? Well, I think it's not a single biomarker because for this fertility is too complex. Yeah, but what what will be able, basically, we have a number of differently expressed transcripts and each breeding organization, basically, they, they can look in, in their material, in, in their genotypes, whether there is genetic variation in the genes that are differently expressed in the coding region or in the regulatory region that are 
associated with fertility. And this is something that we cannot answer because we just identified the differently expressed genes and now the breeding organizations have to look in their populations whether this might be relevant. On the other hand, we have very interesting proteome changes in oviduct fluid, for instance, or also in the uterine fluid, and of course they could be interesting, uh, for instance, as uh, they could be reconstituted in in vitro production systems, and this is going on in the, uh, in the project of, of Giovanni Lassari, and eventually we help to improve the, the IDF uh, or IDP system. Uh, well, thank you, Eckhart. I think it is very relevant what you said, that it is usually not one single biomarker that can tell you something about the uh, fertility status of an animal, but it's more the combination of different uh, biomarkers and data that you can use to actually predict what the fertility of a single animal uh, will be. Uh, I don't know, uh, Pascal Mermilio, do you have anything to add uh, to this? Oh, it's, it's exactly the same. It's more a transcriptional signature a single marker which could be informative and we have seen in the FECOIN project that different models can uh, impact different compartments of the female reproductive tract so it means that we have markers at different levels of the early reproduction and not only one single marker. All right well thank you Pascal, uh, thank you uh, to you all uh, I see there are no further questions, so I guess we can move to the conclusions of the uh, webinar. Uh, well, this was uh, the first experiment for us to, uh, to hold a webinar, and well, I think it was pretty successful in the end. Uh, I want to remind all the uh, participants to fill in the uh, evaluation form uh, after the uh, webinar, and I want to thank especially uh, our colleague uh, Chagla Kaya from FHUB for the effort that she made in organizing uh, this, uh, this webinar and in making this uh, possible. So uh, thanks to uh, my colleagues, to, uh, to Charla and to all the participants for this um, successful uh, webinar. Uh, well, I hope to, uh, to have the chance of interacting uh, with you uh, further on uh, in other occasions. Thank you, Filippo. So Thank thanks. you. Thank you all. I think Charla will uh, take care of... Uh, uh, closing the, the session. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.